Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I will be subbing in for Lori this morning, so hopefully I can teach you all a little bit about Lagrangian and cost effectiveness in environmental policies. So we start out the day with this really classic old school 1800 story about railroads. Back in the day, they had railroads going through croplands and sparks would come off of these railroads and destroy some of the croplands. And the farmers didn't really know what to do. And this was like a classic negative externality. It was actually, so not 1800, 1960s debate. This is what kind of started it all. And um, the producers didn't really know what to do. It was a producer externality. The train creates this negative externality to the crop growers. And so there was one solution put forward by Peru that was um, trying to internalize this externality. So if we force the train company to take into account the damages that they are exerting on these farmers, they would internalize that externality and the damage, it would reduce their damages. And so, you know, for example, the train could pay for those costs and then maybe they would think, hmm, maybe we should put up some shields, reduce those damages that we're doing to the crop owners, uh, just some sort of incentive. And that makes the externality like all other production costs and causes the firm to internalize it. And so that's a Peruvian solution. It's basically, let's come up with a policy that makes firms take into account their negative externalities on society, and this way we solve the market failure. Well, Ronald Coase didn't really like that so much, so in the 1960s he wrote an article, The Problem of Social Cost, and he said really the Peruvian solution really isn't a solution at all, it's just another excuse for government intervention. The markets aren't solving this issue on their own, but they're giving the government an excuse to come in and implement a tax or a subsidy or some sort of policy that incentivizes or changes the behavior of the firms to take into account their externalities that they're generating. And so Pagubian said, you know, this isn't really a lazy fair approach. And he came from the Chicago School, which is all about lazy fair economics. Let the magic hands of Adam Smith in the market work to find the equilibrium. And so when markets um, fail independently, rather than giving the government room to step in, we should find a way for the markets to sort themselves out. So COS is all about defining property rights. For example, if we give the property rights to the landowner, say the landowner owns all these croplands and the train company is coming in and causing damage to that property, then the train owner must pay some sort of remedy to the crop owners for those damages. Alternatively, you could say that the train company owns all the land that's around their little train tracks and the farmers would have to pay the money to put up shields or reduce their damages in some way. This would require bilateral bargaining. So the train owner and the landowner get together in a room and say, hey, here's a problem. These are my property rights that you are damaging. Let's fix this. Uh, it also requires low transaction costs. It shouldn't cost anything for the landowner and the crop owner to come together in that room, come to a solution, and everyone's better off. Um, this would be possible if there was just two major companies, Monsanto and Amtrak, I guess, or you know, just two big players that could get together that have similar bargaining power, similar resources at their disposal. They could bargain. They could come up with a solution. Um, but that's not really realistic, right? We've got lots of mom and pop farmers, crop owners, lots of different train companies. It's very difficult to get everyone in the room together to bargain and come up with these kind of bilateral solutions. And property rights might not always be well-defined. And there might not be zero transaction costs. And so Lori wanted to present these two kind of stories to you guys, these two different schools of thought uh, that you can use to approach market failures, and two types of solutions when dealing with negative externalities. In practice, more likely than not, the Cosian solution is going to be very difficult. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is a school of thought, it is a very foundational paper, and it's all about talking about defining property rights. And there's still groups today, like the Property Environment Research Center, that kind of work in the Cosian realm. But for today's purposes, we're going to live in Peruvian world, we're going to look at how can we design policy instruments that internalize these externalities. How can we incentivize firms by working with their marginal cost curves 
to get them to internalize these externalities. And so, you know, as policymakers, you might take into account a bunch of different policy choices, like policy instruments. And when we're trying to choose a policy instrument, we might have different stated goals and standards. Is the policy cost effective? In this case, cost effective means the lowest cost solution. So if we want a cost effective solution, we want the solution that would achieve our goal at the lowest cost possible. Maybe we want an instrument choice that Ha that there's information readily available. We don't want to spend a lot of money collecting data, trying to get impossible to find information. Maybe it's information the government already has, um, or that's easily accessible. Is monitoring and enforcement possible? We don't want to implement a policy that would be very difficult to monitor or enforce. This happens a lot in fisheries where fishing boats are operating out of sight of anybody, and we really don't know what they're doing out there. And so if there's all sorts of solutions to try and enhance monitoring enforcement at sea, that's a very big challenge for fisheries policies, for example. Uh, is the policy flexible in the face of change? If you have changing resource stocks that are changing at a more rapid rate than the rate of government working, you want policies that might be more flexible and easily adaptable to the situation. You might also want dynamic incentives for technological change. So technology R&D could reduce costs of abatement, reduce compliance costs. So we might want to incentivize firms to engage in technological change um, and advancement to make everyone better off. In other realms, so a lot of those are kind of in the economics realm, such as cost effectiveness. That's a very economist tool. Uh, when economists are looking at policies, that's one of the things that we focus on. But that's not the only thing to focus on. You might also want to take into account the equitable, the equitable distribution of impacts, of benefits. Uh, you might want to take into account whether or not the policy is transparent or is it feasible. And so these are all different types of goals we want to take into account when designing policy. Um, but not all of them are strictly in the domain of economics. Uh, so today, since we are in an economics class, we are going to focus on cost effectiveness. That isn't to say it's the only thing you should ever focus on, but it is one piece of the puzzle, one piece of the solution. So looking at pollutants, is everyone on board up until now? Cool, because now we're getting into math world, so be ready. Um, we have a spectrum of pollutants in the world. Uh, you can have stock pollutants, which kind of stick around in the environment. They don't decay very quickly, and that can range on a spectrum to fund pollutants, which might be more transient, they might um, decay more rapidly over time. So is anyone, can anyone tell me what that little dot, that little funny dot over the S means? Der derivative with respect to time. So when you see a variable with a dot on top of it, that means it's the rate of change over time. So we're taking the derivative of S, whatever S is, that function, with respect to time. And in this case, E sub T is our emissions, the amount of pollutant that we are emitting, minus D, which is how much that pollutant is decaying. And that gives us the kind of stock, the amount of pollutant left after each time period. And so a pure stock pollutant would have zero decay, just kind of sticks around in the environment and might just increase as firms keep polluting. And a pure fund pollutant has decay equal to emissions. So each period it's kind of washed out, but then gets replaced with new emissions. Um, CO2 is more like a stock pollutant than flow, so we'll treat it as a relative stock pollutant. A pure fund or flow pollutant um, could be something more like you'd find in water pollution, um, something more transient in the atmosphere. We also have, so that's one category of pollutants. So you have stock or fund, or somewhere on that spectrum. Now we have another set of categories, so you can make like a box, uniformly mixed or non-uniformly mixed. So uniformly mi mixed means that the concentration of the pollutant happens anywhere in the water watershed, it's the same. So CO2, doesn't matter where you emit it, it is causing an impact around the globe. Non-uniformly mixed means that concentration is speci location specific. So this was a particularly important for like SO2 carbon chain, where it is emitted is more important. It has a higher concentration. If you have a pipe going into a lake around that pipe with like sticky mercury or lead, there might be a higher concentration of pollutant there immediately outside of the pipe and its surrounding area than somewhere else on the globe. It's not uniformly mixed. 
So um, lead would be kind of uniformly mixed, um, non-uniformly mixed, and carbon dioxide is uniformly mixed. And for this thing, we're going to focus first on uniformly mixed pollutants. So it doesn't matter, we're not caring about location. It doesn't matter where you emit this pollutant, it is having the same effect everywhere. In more advanced models, you could look at spatial dynamics and say, okay, if we emit here, then there's higher concentration, and those have higher marginal impacts than someone further away. Oh no, more math. Okay, so we have two firms in this example. I think on the homework you will have three. And we're looking at cost effectiveness. So cost effectiveness is very different from efficiency. In efficiency, we are weighing the costs and the benefits. We are setting marginal costs equal to marginal benefits and saying at that little intersection point, that's the efficient level of pollution and that's our goal. So now throw away all those marginal benefits, <coughs> throw all that away. We know what our goal is, what is the lowest cost solution to get to that goal. And the reason, there, there's like a very historical reason behind this. So we've discussed a lot of ways to measure valuation of existing services. We've talked about contingent valuation, travel costs. There's a lot of debate underlying these. And a lot of times it's very difficult to convince a judge or a legislator that you accurately measured all the possible benefits and the whole marginal benefits side of the mm -hmm. equation. And it was very difficult for economists to get into the conversation or get into the room as long as they were focusing on benefits and costs. And so there's even, you know, this kind of sounds familiar, there's even agencies that were banned from taking that into account. They couldn't even think about calculating benefits. And so what everyone decided would be easiest, the way to get economists part of the conversation was, look, set all that aside. Just tell us the level of abatement that you want and we will find you the solution the cheapest solution to get to that level of abatement. And so that really changed a lot of things. It was something everyone could agree on. Oh yeah, sure, so you know, the EPA director wakes up in the morning, huh, yeah, I think we should abate like 100 tons of CO2 this year. <coughs> or, you know, a bunch of politicians get in a room together, decide this number. Okay, let's call in some economists, figure out what the solution is. Um, and it let economists join the conversation. That's pretty cool. But it could also mean, as Lori put it, uh, that we are taking the fast train to the wrong station, the fast train to the stupid solution. Um, so we could, you know, the EPA person wakes up in the morning and comes up with a too stringent or too relaxed abatement level, but it doesn't matter. We don't know that it's too stringent or too relaxed. She just gives us a number and we follow it. And so that's, and then we can end up spending a lot of money to get to the stupid or the wrong level. And so that's kind of the trade-off. We're not worrying about calculating those benefits, we're taking them all as given, we have our set level of abatement, but maybe that set level is wrong. However, in our magical world of problem sets, we're just going to pretend everything works out happily, and we're going to disregard the marginal benefits and just look at the marginal cost curves. So in our world, we have two plants, and we want to require some level of gunk abatement. Q is the quantity of gunk abated, so we're looking at goods, so we don't want Pollution is not a good, it's a bad. But abatement is a good. So here our quantity is level of pollution abated. And we ha they're heterogeneous firms, so each one's gonna abate a different, there's a typo, it should be Q1 is the quantity of pollution that is abated by plant one, little Q2 is the quantity of pollution abated by plant two, uh, C1 of Q1 is a, the co total abatement cost function for plant one, and the total cost abatement um, function for plant two. And so they each have different costs. We don't know what those are, but they're heterogeneous firms. And our goal is to reach Q bar. We want Q bar total level of abatement. So that little funny formula on the top, min, so our objective function, we want to minimize costs, right? We want to find the most cost effective solution. So we're going to minimize based on our choice variables, so Q1, little Q1 and little Q2 are our choice variables, we're going to minimize the sum of the total abatement costs for each firm. Subject to, so ST is subject to the constraint, Q bar is equal to the sum of little Q1 and little Q2. So whatever solution we find, the amount of ideal abatement, cost effective level of abatement for, for plant one, plus Plant two should equal Q bar. And so that's our constraint, and we have our minimization cost function. Yeah. 
preaching today includes also that <coughs> one of the should be positive, or I actually consider that one of the companies could actually have a negative kind of statement and the other one could have a more than the. <coughs> So, Lawrence, we're mostly working in kind of like clean, um, simple triangles, uh, linear functions that shouldn't arise when we use these. I mean, I, I guess hypothetically, it wouldn't have to be negative, it might be zero if you had that, because you wouldn't, if you had Q1 plus Q2 and you had a negative number there, it would just, it would make things wrong. And so, if you're getting negative numbers, well, they get in a capacitor and trade this is like I actually emit more than I can and then I buy them. So yeah, so I'm tap and trade. So we're not there yet, but yeah, tap and trade. When you do those types of problems, you have your sell, like how much quota you sell and how much you buy. And then you might get negative numbers. But this, we're not even saying we're assigning you guys. You get this much, there's no trading. Um, I think next class we're gonna think. So that's you're like hinting at, well, I can't just come in and say, hey, from one, congratulations, you're bidding eight units, you're bidding two. Go at it. People aren't going to be happy. And so the smart way is, well, how do we get firms to do this on their own? Cap and trade. So then you can sell to him, and then you have that kind of that flow of, of payment. But for in this world, we're just assigning you a positive number and you a positive. Maybe it's zero and a positive number, maybe you're both positive. Um, but yeah, good question. <laughs> so this is, this is the world we've been working in. Unconstrained optimization problems. We are we want to find the maximum where the slope of the function, the derivative of f of x with respect to x, is equal to zero. Great. We can even do it for two variables and have this really cool dome where we take the partial derivative. So when you have that little cursive looking d, that's partial derivative of the function of x and y with the partially um, with respect to x. It's equal to zero, and with respect to y, is equal to zero. So if I follow that line of x or that line of y on the top of that dome, that's like our efficient, unconstrained optimiza um, optimization solution. But unfortunately, we're not in that world anymore. We're in the constrained optimization world. And so in this problem, we have an optimization problem with one variable. I want to maximize the value of y subject to the fact that y has to lie on that line. So that line going across is y equals 20 minus x. So where those two curves intersect, that's our solution. But, oh no, d of y with respect to d of x is not equal to zero. We can't just set functions equal to zero anymore. Ah, uh, it's terrible. Um, so I've got a crazy idea, guys. Really crazy. We're going to add a third variable. And this will magically create an unconstrained optimization problem where we can set everything equal to zero again and the function will be well defined so we don't have to worry about second order conditions, no need to take second derivatives, thanks to Lori. Um, but we'll be able to solve the problem. How do we do that? Let me tell you. This is Lagrangian, your new best friend for this course. I miss the days as a master student when I only had to worry about Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Um, so this is our problem that we had earlier. We're minimizing this joint uh, cost function with respect to the fact, um, subject to the fact that we're summing up Q1, Q, Q2 to Q bar. And we're going to introduce this new variable called the Lagrange multiplier. And some, so he, he looks like this, Lagrange, uh, little lambda. So in some textbooks it might be pi or p for price. But in any engineering, any mathematic world that you're in, it's going to be lambda. It's going to be called the Lagrange multiplier. And we're using it, um, it's, it's used pretty much anywhere you're ever solving an optimization problem. And the reason it's usually called p or pi in economics is that it relates to price, shadow value or shadow price. And so we'll see that as we solve out the problem. So this is our objective function. And that's our constraint. Those are your two main pieces to create this Lagrangian problem. There's your little lambda guy. So I'll write out all of our pieces to the puzzle. <coughs>
don't do it around the minimization part. You need to write C function C1 is a function of Q1. Function C2 is a function of Q2. There's our objective. Plus, we're going to do our little Lagrangian multiplier guy. And now we're going to do the constraint, which we're going to write it as the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is bar, Q bar, minus the left-hand side. There's other ways to do this. If you watch the video, we might have done this another way. This is the way I'm teaching you today. If you're comfortable with another way of setting that up, have at it. But in this class, we're generally going to say right, right hand side minus left hand side. So that's our Lagrangian step one. Everyone clear with that? Yeah. What's the symbol on the left? Is that the Lagrangian? Yeah, it's just a fancy L. This is your lambda. So that's the, the new guy that we introduced, our third variable, lambda, who could also be p or pi. And we're going to figure out what lambda exactly is as we solve through this. But the key is he's our Lagrange multiplier. And we need the Lagrange multiplier to solve out the problem. So there's some fancy <coughs> animations, Lagrange multiplier, and constraint. A lot of math. Okay, so now we're gonna have a party with partial. Oh yeah, question. Um, wouldn't the whatever is in the parentheses there just be bar minus yeah. bar minus q? Because that's just We we want to get to that. Yeah, but yeah, you, it's just the way you set it up because we're not. Um, we don't know what q one and q two are at this point. Okay. And so we want to solve, and you'll see we're setting it. Look at that. We're set it equal to zero in the bottom. Um, but this is just, we're trying to get the value of lambda. We want to find the value of lambda, and we need three partial derivatives with respect. So if you have more variables, you might have more partial derivatives. So you want partial derivatives with respect to all of your variables. So your choice variables were q1 and q2. In some cases, you might have three choice variables, 20 choice variables. You want to do all with respect to your choice variables, and with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, which then gets you that inner part. Yeah? I mean, in those numerators, in those derivatives, wouldn't you just do, like, can I include multiple dark values? Like, if, like, if I have multiple, multiple frustrations, can I include multiple of them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, you have subject two, and that's going to be very common. I think even in Marty's class, you might get to two. I don't know. I've definitely worked with two or three before. Um, and then those are from the shadow price oh, <laughs> for each that's of their true. constraints. Um, that's, yeah, that's advanced world. But you could definitely have, for every constraint you have, you do right hand side minus left hand side. No, left hand side minus right hand side. And, um, and put the Lagrange multipliers. So you could do lambda, mu, until that you run out of Greek alphabet letters. So, partial derivatives. So we're going to do the partial derivative of our Lagrange here. With respect to our first variable, <coughs> q1, and we're going to set that, that's going to be equal to taking derivative of function t1, q1, minus. All right, so we get that. So we, where do we find q1 in this equation? Here's q1. So we're going to take the derivative of our cost, first firm's cost function with respect to q1. No Q1 here, can skip it. Oh, there's Q1 with Lagrange. So we do minus the R lambda, and we set it equal to zero. Everyone good with partial derivative? So the next one, we're gonna do the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to our second control, vari uh, control variable, Q2. So where do we find Q2? Second cost function. And I'll walk us through a concrete example after this. So this is just kind of the base formula for any problem you have. And then the next set of slides I'm going to give you is an actual concrete example <coughs> conceptualize this. And where else do we find Q2? <coughs> Being multiplied by lambda. Set that equal to zero. And then finally, we're going to take the partial derivative of lambda. These are not twos. My first calculus class ever, I was lost for uh -huh. an hour because I thought they were twos. Those are your partial derivative signs. Partial derivative with respect to lambda. 
So where do we see lambda? Oh, he's multiplying this whole guy. So, as we were saying, so q bar minus q1 minus q2 is equal to zero, as we said earlier. And so now we want to solve this out for lambda. So we can very easily say lambda is equal to part derivative of c1 with respect to q1, lambda is equal to d c2 with respect to d q2. Oh, I think I can set those guys equal to each other, right? So d c1, d q1 is equal to d c2, d q2. This is very important. Can anyone tell me what that means? Intuitively? Exactly. So, didn't hear. So, the marginal costs for firm one to bait Q1 units should be equal to the marginal cost for firm two. So, we are equating the marginal cost of the two firms. Um, and that would be the solution to this cost minimization problem, where marginal abatement costs for each firm are exactly equal. And we are satisfying the constraint. So that we just rewrite our constraint. Q bar is equal to Q1 plus Q2. So these are the two things we must satisfy. And this is the generic solution. It doesn't matter if it's N firms. Um, they will always be equaling the marginal costs of each firm. And so in the problem set, I think you're going to have three firms to work with. all those wonderful animations. So equate marginal abatement costs and satisfy your constraint. So let me find an eraser. Now we're going to do a concrete example. So this was, this is your very generic solution that you could plug in your formulas and solve, but just to make sure everybody's on board, we'll put some real numbers out there and we'll even have a <laughs> little marginal cost graph to look at. So once again, we have two heterogeneous, different abatement cost functions. Uh, for firm one, it's quadratic, it's concave up or convex, whichever you learned, and it's increasing at an increasing rate. So that's just the Q1 squared. And then firm two also has a quadratic cost function, but it's higher. It's 4Q2 squared. So they have a higher marginal abatement cost. So we write down the objective function. Let's see if she does that. Yep. So I'll just remember. So L is going to be equal to our objective function. morning and said, we shall abate 10 units of pollution between these two firms. Don't know what the marginal benefits are of that, but that's going to be the level of abatement, and we want a cost-effective solution. We want to minimize the costs to get 10 units of abatement. So, our steps, we're going to have to take our three partial derivatives again. Oop, more fun animations. Everybody Follow? Everything good? Cool. So, once again, we have two control variables. So we're going to take the partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to our first control variable, Q1. And so that's going to be equal. So Q1 squared, derivative of that, we get 2Q1. And we're also going to see Q1 with lambda. So minus lambda is equal 
to zero. Next partial derivative is going to be with respect to our second control variable, q2, which 2 times 4, 8, 2 minus 1 is 1, so it's 8q2, that guy doesn't come there anymore, and we see lambda multiplying just q2 <coughs> equal to 0. And then, once again, our constraint, so derivative of lambda, partial derivative with respect to lambda, is going to be equal to 10 minus q1 minus q2 is equal to 0, which gives us our constraint function again. And then here, we've got lambda is equal to 2q1. Here we get lambda equal to 8q2. <coughs> Set those equal to each other. <coughs> go. So our equation 1 and our equation 2 apply it to q1 is equal to 8q2. Do some algebra. q1 is equal to 4q2. And we want to substitute 3. So, oh no, q1 and q2 are not equal to each other. But we can play off of here and we can substitute this into 3 to get 10 is equal, so q1, q1, 4q2, plus q2, um, q2, that's just 5q2, 10 divided by 5 is 2, so q2, firm 2, is going to abate 2 levels of pollution, and if we plug that back into there, that means firm 1 will abate 8. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because we said firm 2 had really high abatement costs. They had 4 times q to, uh, squared, whereas firm 1 only had q squared. So firm 1 has relatively lower <laughs> abatement costs, and that means, sorry, guy, you're going to have to abate a lot more. Uh, congratulations. We can also solve for the lambda equation, so does she do this? Yeah, so we can solve for lambda, which is very important. So we just plug these numbers back in. So we have that lambda is equal to 2q1. Put, plug in 8, and we get lambda equals 16. And you could have used either equation for that. If you get different answers, that's a problem. So good al algebraic check is to plug q1 and q2 into your, these equations and make sure you get the same lambda value. Um, is, what is lambda in terms of our final solution? So, great question. I will now explain what lambda is. Look, what is lambda? Interpreting the Lagrange multiplier. So, first, in any classroom in the world that you land in magically and you're solving an optimization problem, you'll see lambda and it will be interpreted by how much less if it's a minimization problem, so if your objective function is min, how much less of your objective function, how much less your objective function will be if you, so I think that's supposed to be tight, or relax the, relax the constraint. Um, or if it's a maximization problem, how much more your objective function will be in that case. So if we went, so here we have 10 units of abatement is our ideal goal. Um, we want 10 units reduced. So if we increase that to 10.0001, the total cost of abatement would go up by our increase, so 0 0.001, times lambda. So that the, total, the new cost of abatement would be like 0 0.016 cents. And so this is the shadow value or the shadow price. Um, this means it also has a price interpretation, a dollar value. You'll hear it referred to as the shadow value. And in this particular problem, it is the price of the last unit of abatement. In the next lecture, you'll see it show up as a price as we discuss taxes or other policy <coughs> price instruments. So in cap and trade, lambda might come up as what is the value of the quota or the permit that you're trading. In a tax, it might come up as what is the ideal tax to place 
um, to get the firms to behave the way you want. And so that's exactly this. It's a reasonable response that no one is going to like the solution. The firms are not going to be happy if you go to one and say you have eight and you go to the other and you have two. But if you set the tax to $16 per unit of, bait, um, per unit of pollution, for example, we would expect that the firms on their own would reach that solution. So the one that has a higher abatement cost and he has a tax, he would just do two. And the guy that has a lower abatement cost, well, he doesn't want to pay a bunch of taxes. It doesn't really cost him that much money to abate. So he'll go ahead and go to eight units of abatement. So this is like kind of, what is that where you, I told, like, you better not do this. And then the kid goes and does it. Um, so you affirm, you better not abate eight units of pollution, wink, wink, unless I'm going to tax you. And then they're just going to do it on their own. So um, the lambda will be like very instrumental in our next lecture of how we use it to inform ideal policy instruments. If you don't like math, but you like spending lots of time drawing graphs, this is the way to graphically solve it. And it's very unintuitive. It's even less intuitive, I think, than some of the other graphs, if you, that was possible. This is not very easy with three firms. Hint, you have three firms on the problem set. So this might not be the solution you want. But if you want to graph it out, if you want to see visually what's happening, I'll explain it to you. So on this graph, we have two firms. My Wii joystick does not work. I did not set up with the MacBook. Uh, we have two firms, and we want 10 units of abatement. So the key here is on the x-axis, right down there, we want Q bar being our highest number. So Q bar was 10 in this example. We want Q bar there. And first we're going to draw for one, going from left to right. So for one, so first you have to figure this equation out. So if you thought you could escape partial derivatives, this is not the class for you. Um, don't worry, they'll become your friend. You'll love partial derivatives. Uh, so we have this equation, and we want to figure <coughs> out, okay, so I think if we abate, look at that, if we abate five, if firm one abates five units of pollution, so you can see five is right at 10. So five times two is 10. So you just fill this in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, two times each of those values mm -hmm. until you get to 20, which 20 is on your y axis. So that's firm one. Now we have to go the other direction. So firm two operates left, right to left, so now 10 is actually 0, 9 is 1, 8 is 2, 7 is 3, Did you do that? 0 is now 10. So draw underneath those numbers 0 to 10 and start with your same equation, 8q2. So 8 times 0, 8 times 1 is going to be, right. so it's, we're looking at the red line. So where you can, a nice point where it intersects is eight times five is 40. So you see the red line hits 40 on the y-axis. And then the max abatement cost would be at 10. So eight times 10 is 80. Does that, does that appear to people? <coughs> Do you want me to draw it on the board? Yeah. Is it on the y-axis? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that would just be yeah, your solution. Yeah. So you're using these two. So that's a great point because where you look, where they intersect, we have eight units of abatement for firm one because we're going left to right. That eight is actually equal to two in firm two world. So we're saying firm one, you obey eight. Firm two, you obey, or I think I backwards did. Um, for, yeah, firm one, eight, firm two, two. And... Then, if you look at the y-axis, lambda is 16. So it's exactly as you said. And that's how you could get it graphically for two firms. Would anyone like me to repeat that or draw it out? Yes. OK. Yes, question. Yeah, sorry. So I mean, I understand what's going on. But what is the reasoning behind essentially reversing what you would normally think of how to you know, graph this you know, simple line like that? It's just how economists have always done it. Uh, um, yeah, no, Lori did not explain that in her lecture. But I think we've always, like, in every Econ 101 class, or like resource Econ, we've always done it this way. And I think 
it's just a way to draw both firms out. Because if you drew each firm on the same way, you would never get an intersection. Nice. So we want to see where their marginal costs are equated, and so that's why we go. But then you have all the negatives. Yeah. I no, think I think your slope is. Oh, yeah, the slope. Increasing, right? Yeah. Sorry. But you would still start at 80. But you yeah. To go down. Yeah. Decreasing, but increasing. You could do it that way. <coughs> so, you want me to. I'll draw it out for people. The, got it. I'm going to keep our two main equations. <coughs> So for one, two times one, I'll just do Two times ten is twenty. So you kind of it should be a straight line. Less for one marginal costs are for one. Now they're going to be the same. Where we have lambda is equal to two q one, and this. Should be, we have Q1 is equal to 8, Q2 <coughs> is equal to 2, and lambda is equal to 16. <coughs> is that clear? Is that better? Cool. 
So that's how you could graphically solve it if you have two firms. Three firms is more complicated and highly unrecommended for solving the problem set. And it doesn't really save you that much more time than going through the Lagrangian since you need the partial derivatives anyways to solve this. So you're already solving equations one and two. You just have to do the extra step of three, which isn't that hard for subtract, basically setting your constraint and solving it all out. So after all that math, what's the takeaway message here? So the cost effective allocation of pollution abatement is always going to be the one where the marginal costs of abatement are equal amongst all n plants. You could have two firms, three firms, a hundred firms. We're setting their marginal costs equal to each other. And the ones that have higher marginal costs will have a lower cost effective level of abatement. And this is true no matter how many plants you have. So you will see on your next homework, you'll probably have three and she'll give you the different equations and using the Lagrangian would be the great way to solve it out. And as we mentioned, the Lagrangian multiplier, that's occurring over your constraint function. If you have multiple constraint functions, you'll have multiple Lagrangian multipliers as well. So this is a very expandable type of method. It should hypothetically work, but she, like I think you'd have to have even, you might even have a third dimension on there. Yeah, so there, if you can't just keep piling on firms, you would need more dimensions. So that's why there's really no graphical way to draw it out for multiple firms. Okay. It's really just a two firm, two dimensional illustration. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Yeah. So what are lambda units? You just do lambda equal, but yeah, when we start interpreting it okay. and getting more advanced into the intuition underlying lambda, then we'll want to refer to it as this dollar shadow price value. Great question. Anything else? Oh no, I talked really fast. Getting out really early. I hope everything was clear. Is there anything anyone would like me to go back over on the slides? I really don't mind at all. Yeah. You could do one, two, three, you could do all ten. I just chose simple ones that would give me even numbers that align with the y axis. Can you explain one more time about this point that the marginal costs are equal amount? Yeah, so basically, if we go back here, wait, no, let's go back to the generic solution. So there we go. So. Whenever, you, if you have firm one, two, three, four, each firm is going to have its own cost function. Usually they're going to be heterogeneous, which means they're going to be different. So for each firm, you're going to want to do the derivative of its cost function with respect to its level of abatement, Q1, Q2, through Q little n. And when you solve that out with your Lagrange multiplier, so you do the partial derivative of the Lagrange with respect to each of your control variables. So if you have three firms, you'd have an additional line there that would say partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect um, to Q3 is equal to D C3 with respect to um, Q3 minus lambda is equal to zero. And so, and if you had other numbers in front of that, if you had 2Q1 or three, like we saw, you would solve that out. But basically, the more firms you have, the more lines you're going to add, the more partial derivatives you're going to do for each of your control variables. So it's likely each firm will have its own level of abatement. And that's going to be another control variable for you, the policymaker, to determine. Yeah. Um, so if you have three firms and you go with first, left, right, and then right, left, and no instructions for ones. No, that's so that's the question. Um, you, it, it's not graphically possible. It would be a three-dimensional. Like you could probably do it in MATLAB. So that was Lori's joke. You don't want to sit here and solve partial derivatives, but you'd like to go learn MATLAB or Mathematica, which lets you kind of do three-dimensional graphing systems and. It'll do derivatives for you sometimes if you're stuck. Um, it, you would need software to graph it out. Yeah. You would end up getting each one is minus lambda, so yeah, you'd set them all equal. And then your constraint is really key here because that lets you plug and play. So, because you can't really sit there and solve Q1 for Q2, but you could plug in 
if you have Q1 is equal to this value that includes Q2, then you could pl plug it into the other thing and solve for Q2 first and then solve for Q1. <coughs> and you would do that iteratively for each one. So you still just have that one constraint, like constraint minus Q1 minus Q2 minus. Yeah, and you could have more than one constraint hypothetically. You could have as many constraints as you could think of. Um, so a lot of times in natural resource management will have multiple constraints. And that just means you end up with a lambda, a, a mu, or you could do lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And so each constraint ends up having its own lambda associated with it. <coughs> Was that helpful for the marginal cost? Cool. Great. Cool. Well, if we have no further questions, I will let you guys go and start thinking about, I think the next prompt set should be online.